right now, and I think we'll get started. Um, I would like to welcome everybody to this afternoon's um, Ontario Nature Reserves Tour uh, special webinar. My name is Justin Peter, and I'm Director of Programs at Quest Nature Tours, and we are delighted to be um, to be a partner of Ontario Nature and uh, especially today to be partnering with Ontario Nature on the second of our Ontario Nature Reserves virtual tours. And today we have a very special uh, virtual tour. Um, I'm sure many of you are excited about learning more about the four different Ontario Nature Reserves on the Saugeen Bruce Peninsula. And um, uh, some of you, I mean, I, I think many of you will be familiar with the Bruce Peninsula. Um, you may not be f as familiar with the, the name, the full name, Saugeen Bruce Peninsula, but we're going to learn a little bit more about that name and and uh, and uh, what what is the meaning behind that. And um, today's speaker is um, Smera uh, Sakumars. Smera, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Oh, there you are. Okay. Hi, Smero. Um, Hi. Smero, uh, I think Smero will be speaking to us for about 45 minutes uh, today on these nature reserves uh, on the Saugeen Bruce Peninsula. And just to give you a little background on Smero, if you haven't met her yet, uh, Smero is the nature reserves manager at Ontario Nature. She's been with Ontario Nature since uh, 2016, managing all of, and this, this was really interesting to me, managing Ontario Nature's 26 nature reserves and three conservation easements for biodiversity conservation. Um, she runs uh, research projects, collaborates with uh, volunteer stewards of partner organizations and conducts public outreach. And Samara has conducted surveys on the Saugeen Bruce Peninsula for several years and is excited, I think, uh, to share her knowledge of the very unique ecosystems and, and rare ones, if I might add, as well. And uh, Samara holds a Master's in Biodiversity and Conservation from the University of Leeds in the United Kingdom and previously uh, completed her Bachelor of Science in Zoology at the University of Guelph. Uh, she's an avid traveler and has backpacked through Europe and Southeast Asia and has visited 43 countries worldwide. Well, you sound just like our type of traveler, Samara. <laughs> and with uh, without further ado, I will pass it on to you, Samara, to tell us all about these wonderful nature reserves. Great. Thank you so much, Justin. And thank you so much, Quest, for having us. We're really excited to be uh, showcasing some of the properties that Ontario Nature um, holds for conservation. Um, so thank you so much. And I'm really excited to be here virtually. Usually I'm used to looking out on an audience. Um, so looking forward to feedback. And I think, um, we're going to have time for a question period at the end. So uh, looking forward to some of your questions as well. Um, so before we get started, I'd like to start with a land acknowledgement. So since we're unable to gather in person today, I would like to acknowledge the land that I am situated on here. I'm in our office today in Toronto. Um, and this is the place, the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, and Wendat peoples. And it is the current territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit under the Toronto Purchase Treaty Number no. 13 since that was signed in 1805. Um, since the very beginning, Indigenous peoples have inhabited these lands, which are still home to diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people. And we are very grateful for the opportunity to gather on this territory today, even though under these current circumstances, it's not in person and only virtually. Um, and we continue to hope to work and live in this community moving forward. Um, we commit ourselves to the work of reconciliation with Indigenous peoples and through this land acknowledgement our intent is to honour and show gratitude to those taking care of these lands for over 10,000 years and as a sign of our respect and willingness to learn and heal. Um, as an immigrant to this country I moved here when I was seven so I've been here for most of my life but I was not really educated on Indigenous territories, lands or rights and think it's really important to acknowledge the broken covenants throughout settler history and the need to reconcile with all our relations. So our hope is that we can come together to care for this remarkable land and for each other for many generations to come. Um, and I'm really excited to talk with you about this really, really special place, the Saugeen Bruce Peninsula today. 
So before we get started, a little bit about Ontario Nature. I'm sure a lot of people in the audience, I recognize a lot of names as well, uh, are familiar with Ontario Nature. And our mission is to protect wild species and wild spaces through conservation, education, and engagement. Um, we are an environmental charity and we were established as the Federation of Ontario Naturalists, which the name may be familiar to a lot of you, um, back in 1931. And we consist of 150 member organizations that include nature clubs, um, which I know many of you are a part of. And we have a really great uh, member base of over 30,000 members and supporters. Um, so a little bit about our nature reserves program. Um, this map just depicts where our properties are located all over Southern Ontario. Um, we have 26 nature reserves, uh, as Justin mentioned, totaling over 3,100 hectares and over 7,600 acres. Um, they protect imperiled habitats, rare habitats, flora and fauna, um, and they're really great places to go visit. Um, they span all the way down from um, Stone Road Alvar on Peely Island up to, we have a couple of properties on St. Joseph Island and east to uh, Riley Bird, uh, sorry here, Riley Bird near Deep River. Um, so really spanning all across uh, Southern Ontario. And we're gonna focus specifically today on the properties on the Saugeen Bruce Peninsula. And you'll see that it's our greatest uh, concentration of our reserves. Um, and that's because there's really fantastic habitats here that we really need to protect. Um, our nature reserves are a safeguard for habitat for these species. And we do wanna protect the biological diversity in these areas as, um, Ontario Nature also works closely with researchers on uh, research projects to advance our scientific knowledge of these biological systems. And it's also really important for us to create an opportunity for recreation and nature appreciation as well. So we're gonna touch on a few properties where um, you can actually go visit. And then we're also gonna touch on a property that's a bit more remote today. But before we get started, um, talking about these properties, I just wanted to acknowledge that all of the properties we're going to be talking about today actually occur uh, within Saugeen Ojibwe Nation. Um, they are on the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe Nation, and we would like to give thanks to the Chippewas of Nawash Unceded First Nation and the Chippewas of Saugeen First Nation, now known as Saugeen Ojibwe Nation, as the traditional keepers of this land. Ontario Nature is constantly uh, committed to working together with these nations to provide and acknowledge the Indigenous inherent rights to the land and cultural practices as well. Um, so this map was actually taken from SAN or Saugeen Ojibwe Nation's Environment Office. And if you're interested in learning more about this community, you can find that information online. So this is a brief overview of some of the properties we're going to be talking about today. We're actually just going to be highlighting four out of the seven shown here. Um, so the just to give you a virtual kind of uh, tour of what the peninsula is and how it's kind of referred to as different sections. So through here, you'll see Highway 6 and that bisects the peninsula. And we often refer to different portions of the peninsula as the Georgian Bay side, so east of Highway 6, and then the Lake Huron side, which is west of Highway 6. So today we're going to be talking about Malcolm Bluff Shores, which is number four over here. I hope you can see my cursor. Um, Lyle Island, which is number three off the coast of the Lake Huron shoreline. Um, Bruce Alvar, which is just off Highway 6 up here. Um, and actually down here at Petrol Point, which is number five. Um, and I'm sure many of you have actually visited some of these properties, um, but I'm still really excited to walk you through uh, some of the great features of these nature reserves. So the Saugeen and Bruce Peninsula is a really, really special place. It's a biodiversity hotspot along the Great Lakes and is part of the Niagara Escarpment Biosphere Reserve. And it's internationally recognized for its biodiversity. Um, it's really interesting interesting geologically as well. Um, it has portions of the escarpment, which we'll explore at some of our properties today. And certain sections of the escarpment can actually be soaring as high as 120 meters off of ground level. 
Um, and in terms of the geology of the area, the eastern Georgian bay side is more jollystone and shingled and more escarpment features. And the west southwestern side on Lake Huron is more uh, sandy and um, lots of wetlands on that side as well. Actually, nearly 70% of the peninsula is forested with deciduous and coniferous forests and upland forests and swamps. Uh, so it's relative to the rest of Southern Ontario it is more intact, but there's still a lot more protection to be done in the area. And it also has a great concentration of alvars, which we'll be talking about a little bit later, which are, are a globally um, rare ecosystem. Another really interesting fact is that um, there are some of the oldest trees in southern Ontario on the peninsula with some eastern white cedars, uh, which are over 500 years old. And when you actually go and look at these trees, they don't look, you know, huge and massive like, you know, you think of um, some of the trees out west that you're going to be seeing, um, but they're actually stunted because there isn't a huge the soil layer and because of the harsh uh, climate and and weather systems that come through. Um, so yeah, we'll get started kind of walking through our properties. And as I mentioned, you can keep the questions coming in and, and we'll take a look at them at the end. So this is our Petrol Point Nature Reserve. It is one of our most popular properties and um, once you hear more, you'll learn why. It is absolutely spectacular. And um, it's also known as our Garden of Flowers. Uh, it's one of our oldest nature reserves that we acquired back in 1968. And we've continued to add parcels to it until 2019. And this particular property is 38.5 hectares or 95.14 acres. And it's located on the scenic Lake Huron shoreline, so the western portion of the peninsula between Howden Vale and Red Bay. Um, and about 40% of the property is comprised of the Howden Bay, Bay, Bay Area Life Science Area of Natural and Scientific Interest, or an ANSI for short. And this is just um, to recognize the importance of the biological diversity found on the property. And it's also a, a provincially significant wetland. It supports a really impressive diversity of plants, including carnivorous plants, such as sundews and pitcher plants, um, showy lady slipper, rose pagonia, grass pink orchid, um, broadleaf toy blade, just to name a few. Um, so really spectacular diversity here. And this map just shows you some of the trails on the property. Um, so we do have a wheelchair accessible trail that was built just a couple of years ago. Um, and it loops, it's all this red portion here. Um, the wheelchair accessible trail is about 475 meters and there's actually a, an accessible parking lot here as well. Um, the boardwalk is made of a corn husk composite, which is really interesting. It's more eco-friendly and environmental friendly um, and has tow rails um, for those using assistive devices. And there's turnaround spots and resting benches along the way as well. You can actually view a lot of the species that I mentioned um, right from the boardwalk. You will need a pair of binoculars in a lot of cases, but still really great to be able to get up close while not disturbing this really sensitive habitat. We also have a non-wheelchair accessible boardwalk loop up here and a trail that goes all the way out onto Lake Huron and you can get a beautiful view of the shoreline down here. So this um, depicts some of the habitats that I was talking about. So we have the Great Lakes Coastal Meadow Marsh habitat here, some wetland, and also part of the coastal meadow marsh system. And then the accessible trail going through the, the coniferous forest. It also does go through the coastal meadow marsh habitat, as I mentioned. And this property also has um, upland uh, forest as well as eastern white cedar swamp through it, um, which the trail down the southern portion of the property goes through. So here are some of the species that I was mentioning. So we've got the showy lady slipper here. It's actually our lar largest orchid in Canada. Um, it's also called the queen lady slipper um, because of its Latin name, which is uh, Regine. So that 
kind of alludes to the queen. Um, the slipper is actually white with pale uh, pink to deep rose pink coloration. And like the yellow lady slipper, the hairs on the leaves itself can actually be pretty irritating to some people and can cause a rash. Um, generally, we don't want anyone handling these plants. They're really sensitive and have root systems that extend quite far out. So even if you think you're being really careful, if you come really close to your plant, you could be damaging it. So um, that's another huge reason for having a boardwalk so that people can enjoy these beautiful species while also keeping them safe. Um, this species flowers a bit later than some of the orchids on the peninsula from mid-June to mid-July and they're found in wetter habitats such as swamps and marshes. We also have slender leaf sundew and pitcher plant here. Um, they're carnivorous plants um, found on the meadow marsh as well and you can see them easily from the boardwalk. Um, I'm sure many of you are familiar with carnivorous plants and they supplement uh, nutrients that they're not getting from the meadow marsh habitat, such as nitrogen and phosphorus from insects that they capture um, either along their um, hairs here on the edges, they, they secrete a kind of substance, kind of sticky substance that the, the insect gets caught to and then the leaves burl in and capture it. Um, or through a pitcher plant where they land here and it has downward facing hairs and the insects fall into the pitcher plant. So um, there's actually been really interesting studies in Algonquin Park about them finding larval salamanders within the pitcher plant and they're thought to be a significant nutrient source for these pitcher plants. At first they thought it was just a mistake or a, a weird fluke but it's turning out to be a, a pretty significant nutrient source. Um, as far as I'm aware I haven't heard of this happening on the peninsula but I could be wrong and I'd be keen to hear if anyone's anecdotally observed this as well. I've only ever seen insects in here um, but still really interesting. And then we've got the white bog orchid here, grass pink orchid, and occasionally you'll see a snapping turtle um, within the uh, cedar forest uh, on the lower portion of the trail. We came across this one earlier this year when I was out in the field and it was just a small one, but um, this is actually the largest freshwater turtle that you can find in Canada. And this is one that I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with. It's the most common species of turtle. Well, not the most common. Painted turtles um, are more common. Um, but I'm sure you're all aware of the prehistoric iconic looking species with its um, tails with a lot of spines, which you can't really see in this photo. Um, this by no means, as you'll see throughout the presentation, I'm not able to cover the diversity of species found on these properties. Um, but this is just kind of a snapshot and maybe a taster of some of the species you might see if you're able to go and visit these properties. Um, some other species found on this property are redback salamanders. Um, we've seen green frogs, beaked spike rush, tuberous plantain, and dwarf like iris as well. So moving on to another property, we have Malcolm Bluff Shores Nature Reserve, which is on the eastern portion of the peninsula on the Georgian Bay side. And this property showcases some spectacular cliff and talus slope habitat. So you can see the ridge kind of running through up here. There's also beach habitat and in, internally there's lots of deciduous and coniferous upland and swamp habitat as well. Um, this property is actually co-managed with the Bruce Trail Conservancy and some of the Bruce Trail runs through this property. Um, it's about nine kilometers northeast of Wyerton and we acquired it back in 2010. It's 455 hectares or 1,124 acres and supports over 333 species, um, many of which are actually provincially or federally at risk. Um, there's an amazing physical diversity here. As I mentioned, the, the cliffs actually elevate over 110 meters above uh, the, the, the beach. And so that's the highest point on this property in the escarpment. Um, and there are a couple of trails on the property. So there's 
um, two entrances here off of Wright's Crescent or Mallory Beach Road. And so you can see the two trails here, the upper trail and then the lower trail that takes you down to the Shingle Beach. Um, the upper trail is about 6.5 kilometers one way, and the lower trail goes along an old logging road. Um, so it's a bit wider and it's about two kilometers to get to the shoreline. So on the top, you're going to get some stunning views um, like this one. So this is the cliff here looking out. There's also sections of Talis Slope, which is a little more sloping with lots of big boulders. Um, we have Shingle Beach um, that's showing off the, the beautiful crystal clear waters uh, that you're gonna find on, on the Georgian Bay side. Um, there's also interior forests, as I mentioned, that are deciduous and coniferous. Um, and there's also um, tree talus slope. I mentioned open talus slope earlier, but there's also tree sections as well. So some of the species that you're gonna find on the property, um, there are some wetland habitats and there you're gonna find Eastern ribbon snakes. They're really common wetland snake species. And I like to think of them as a garter snake in focus. You'll see that the yellow lines here are really, really sharp and crisp. And the telltale way to identify a ribbon snake is by that white kind of creamy yellow um, marking right in front of the eye and that is the characterizing feature of identifying a ribbon snake um, but often they are misidentified as, as garter snakes so that's um, a pretty easy one to distinguish. Uh, there's also been Canada warblers found on the property and um, those can be identified by the necklace um, and then black bears, which uh, we found scat and prints on the property, and black bears on the peninsula are genetically isolated from the rest of the southern Ontario population. And so they have some extra protections on the peninsula, such as that they're not um, allowed to be hunted as other bears are in southern Ontario. Um, there's also a really great diversity of ferns found uh, on this property, including heart's tongue fern, which doesn't really look like a typical fern, um, but it's called that because of the base of the stem. It kind of looks like a little heart here. I don't know if that's the best picture to show that, but um, it's kind of a glossy dark green uh, color and um, it grows, it's kind of a really short uh, fern. It's about 12 to 40 centimeters long and about two to 4.5 centimeters wide. And it mostly grows in calcareous areas on shaded slopes and in, in forests as well. Um, and then here we have maidenhair spleenwort. Some of you may be more familiar with maidenhair fern. It's a very delicate and beautiful fern. I find it's a lot of people's favorite fern. Um, they have a, a really dark, purple, black rachis, um, rachis or stem. Uh, there's a different, some different terminology for, for ferns. And then each of the pinna, which are these leaves here, are really, really delicate and small and have light teasing uh, with them as well. And um, they're mostly found in cool, shady cliffs and slopes. Um, and they're really, really small as well, um, 10 to 25 centimeters with really narrow fronds. So 10 to 25 centimeters would be the whole length of of the, of the plant in general. So um, some other observations include great crested flycatcher, eastern peewee, um, peregrine falcon has been found on the property and they are the fastest bird in the world and fastest animals. So they actually, when they dive, they can dive up to 320 kilometers per hour. Often people answer for the fastest animal in the world is a cheetah, but they are much slower at 120 kilometers per hour. So um, these, uh, these falcons were actually in decline due to DDT, but they're doing a lot better now, but they're still considered to be at risk. Um, we've also found morning warbler, coopers, milk vetch, wood thrush, oven birds, um, milk snakes on their property as well. Um, so again, a really, really diverse property. So now I am going to try and pull up a poll for all of you to test a bit of your knowledge. Um, so this should come up on your screen. 
I don't know if it's working. Oops. Okay, so hopefully all of you are seeing a poll. Um, I'm not sure yeah. if it can. Yeah, right now we can see how many varieties of ferns do you think occur? We see that question. Okay, are people able to actually fill in the poll? I'm not sure. It looks like you already closed it. Oh, okay. Whoops, sorry. <laughs> it's my first time doing this. I don't know if I can open it again. Um, Okay. Okay. So it doesn't look like I can open it again. But um, anyway, I'll ask and hopefully some of you will think of a, an answer in your head. Um, but how many varieties of ferns do you think occur in Bruce and Gray counties? So the options are either 15 to 20 varieties, 20 to 30, or over 40. Um, and so actually the answer is over 40. Uh, this is the area where we have the highest diversity of fern species in all of southern Ontario. Um, and ferns are really, really interesting. They're the oldest living plants on the face of the earth, existing over 350 million years ago. And the diversity here is really spectacular. Um, in other areas in southern Ontario, you're going to find fewer than 25 varieties. And I say varieties and not species because a lot of these um, species do hybridize as well um, and i'm sure many of you know but ferns also have really interesting ways of reproducing from sori or sporangia which are on the back of the pinna that you often see like for these two species here or walking fern um, reproduces by the tips of the leaves or pinna or fronds um, touching the, the soil. Bulblet ferns produced by uh, reproduced by dropping little bulblets. Um, and there's also ones that reproduce with their rhizomes as well, like hay centered fern. So sorry about that, but hopefully um, there are more polls to come. So hopefully you're able to participate in some of those. Um, so moving on, we're going to go to Bruce Alvar Nature Reserve. So this one's right off of Highway 6, if you remember from our original um, image, just off of Highway 6 on the western portion um, of the peninsula. And it's on the corner of Highway 6 and Dyers Bay Road. It was acquired back in 1993 and is 61.2 hectares or 151 acres. And it's home to 14 globally and provincially rare species, including alvar wildflowers and snakes. Um, it's part of the Johnston Harbor Pine Tree Point ANSI, which I mentioned earlier is just a, a recognition of the biological diversity um, in the area. And it's mostly composed of coniferous forest and lightly vegetated dollastone pavement. It's one of the few places on the peninsula where plants typical of the Georgian Bayside and the Lake Huron side are found together um, and includes alvar habitat along with thicket swamp, meadow marsh, and coniferous forests. Um, so alvars are really interesting habitats, which I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with as well, but um, I think it's really interesting to think of the geology and how these alvars were formed. And here in Southern Ontario, they were actually formed in warm, shallow tropical seas around 460 to 370 million years ago. And more recently shaped by the Wisconsin Glacier about 65,000 years ago. Um, so they are really globally rare and they're found off the coast of Sweden, the Baltic region, the UK, Ireland, and in North America. So I'm going to try pulling up another poll now. And hopefully you see that on your screen. So the question is, which of the following statements is true? Less than 30% of alvars in North America are found in, in Ontario. Between 31 to 50% of alvars in North America are found in Ontario. Between 51 to 70 or over 70%. Um, so I'll just give you a couple of seconds to fill that out. Um, Still see a couple more votes coming in, so I'll give you a couple more seconds. 
and then I will close the poll and share the results. Okay, so I'm just gonna close it now. And then hopefully I'm sharing the results and you can see what that looks like. So it looks like um, we had to compress the answer. So I'm not actually sure. It says that most people voted for Oh, okay. So, oh, never mind. This is right. So, 45% of people voted for over 70% of Alvars, and that's correct. Um, great job. And actually, it's 75% of all Alvars in North America are found in Ontario. So, I think um, if you haven't visited an Alvar already, they're they're all over. Not all over. They're found in certain areas in southern Ontario, specifically uh, around the Great Lakes. Um, and there's probably one closer to you than you think. And these are very special habitats, and I'm so happy that we're able to protect them on our properties. So, um, if you want to visit this property, it has a really short trail system that takes you out to uh, look at the Alvar habitat. So, there's a little trail going out, and then a, a short boardwalk as well, and a little lookout platform. So the boardwalk is really narrow. It only fits about one person like in single file, but it does take you through um, some spectacular habitat through the alvar, through treed alvar, as well as open alvar habitat. And on either side of the trail, if you go at the right time around early June, um, you're gonna see a lot of really special alvar wildflowers. So these include dwarf like iris and lakeside daisy. Um, and then here's also showing the open alvar pavement. So these actually, when you look at them in general, they don't look like spectacular habitats um, if you don't actually think about them. They look kind of barren, but actually they have a great diversity of species that have spe specifically adapted to survive on these harsh environments. In the middle of the summer, these alvars can reach up to 53 degrees Celsius. So it's scorching hot. And in the spring, there is immense amount of flooding. Um, and as you can see, the soil can be really, really shallow. Um, this is actually mostly bryophytes. Um, but, and also there's a, a great diversity of bryophytes found on alvars. I am no bryophyte expert, but um, I do know that there, there are really special places for those as well. You'll also find grapes or fissures within the alvars. This is kind of a little divot within the flat pavement. Um, and here, if you look closely, you're gonna see a Massasauga rattlesnake curled up in here. Um, Massasaugas use these areas to thermoregulate. So if it's too hot out on the pavement, they'll climb into one of these fissures um, and hang out. It's, it's kind of a little microclimate. The moisture regime, the temperature is very different. And so you'll find some interesting fern species and other species along inside these grapes that you wouldn't find out on the open alvar. And here's some treed alvar habitat as well. Uh, in the back of the property, we also have some uh, swamps and marsh ecosystems as well, but that are not accessible from the trail. So some of the species that are found on this property, we've got this beautiful fern, the purple stemmed cliff break, a really dark purple hairy uh, rachis, and kind of evergreen pinna or leaves. You'll see, I don't know how well you can see on your screen because these images are a little bit small, um, but the leaves are incurved, which means that they're kind of curved around in the back. And the reason for that is actually to hold on to some of the water droplets and moisture. Um, these are really, really dry, arid environments in the summer. And so it's really interesting to look at how different species have evolved to, um, kind of adapt to those those environments um and this is a really really small uh fern you're gonna really have to get down on your hands and knees to see it um speaking of small there's also ram's head lady slipper it's the smallest lady slipper found here and it's named ram's head after its english and scientific name uh which refers to the resemblance of the flower to a ram's head. You're gonna have to use a bit of your imagination there. Um, and it is one of the smallest and most inconspicuous lady uh, lady slippers, sorry, um, with a maximum height of about 20 centimeters. Uh, this actually flowers from May to mid-June and is found mostly on the western portion of the peninsula. Uh, there's also dwarf lake iris, which is a species at risk. 
um, one of the most beautiful flowers that looks almost ornamental. Um, and then we have Lakeside Daisy here. Um, on Bruce Alvar specifically, there's also Landsleeved Coryopsis, uh, which looks very, very similar, but can be distinguished um, by the lobes at the end of each of the flowers rather than landscape coreops is having more of a toothed edge. Um, another way to tell them apart is also just the flowering period landscape coreopsis occurs about three weeks before um, leaks are easy but sometimes they do overlap as well. And then there are many snakes found in this property as I mentioned Massasauga rattlesnakes, we've also found milk snakes and garter snakes and here is a ring neck snake. Um, these are smaller bodied snakes and, and are really identifiable by that bright yellow line across uh, the back of its head. Um, yeah, so that's some of the highlights of Bruce Alvar. As I mentioned before, there's so much more and I'm happy to talk about that after. So this is our Lyle Island Nature Reserve. Um, this one I think holds the most intrigue because it's a massive island off of the coast of the Lake Huron shoreline. It's about two kilometers off the shoreline and it's really special because it's the only uninhabited, so the largest uninhabited um, land mass off of the coast. A lot of the other islands do have some sort of human impact and this one is largely uh, absent of that. It's 305 hectares or 754 acres in size. I've been lucky enough to go to this property a couple of times and I know some of the people on this webinar have actually gone as well. Um, it is really unique habitat. It's classified as an ANSI as well and has a, a lot of really special habitats within it. Um, and as you can see, like our this is our property boundary, the yellow line. Um, this portion is actually owned by the Depart Department of Fisheries. There's a lighthouse there. Um, Lake Huron's waters are not forgiving, um, so that's why there's a lighthouse there. Uh, I've actually canoed out to the island once and would not recommend it. Um, we could barely make it back, and I actually met a local after we came back, um, and he told me that there's only about two days of the whole year that it's safe to actually canoe out there, and we were lucky enough that uh, we were able to get back and didn't get stranded on there. <laughs> um, and then over here, we have McMaster Point, which is a small portion, which is owned by the Nature Conservancy of Canada. So a little bit about the habitats found on Lyle Island. We've got some shingle uh, beach, ridge beaches. We've got inland coniferous forest and swamplands as well. We've got lots of um, marshes, and that's what most of the interior is composed of, actually. It's mostly swamp and marshes um, that are absolutely stunning. Um, and then we've got some treed alvar, creeping juniper, and shrubs as well found here. Um, this property is not open to the public, mostly just from a safety perspective of getting out there. Um, if you have a boat and wanted to actually boat out there, uh, you do need to know the waters. Uh, if any of you have boated on that side of the peninsula or, or the eastern side as well, there are areas where there are huge rocks that come really close to the surface. Um, so you do need to be careful. So if anyone is interested in exploring this island, we suggest that you get in touch with us um, we were hoping to have our AGM this year, but nothing went as planned. Um, and we were planning on having an event going out to Lyle. Uh, so maybe that's your ticket to get to get here. Stay tuned for our AGM plans next year. Uh, we'll see how everything goes. Uh, there's also Dollar Stone pavement on this property, um, which is accessible from the southern shores of, of the reserve. So there are a lot of massasagas on this island. Um, often when exploring, you're trudging through knee to waist deep swamp. You get to a beautiful open marsh and you'll see a few massasagas just scattered in the wetlands. Um, and you, most people don't even see them. Um, I know that there's sometimes a fear of these because they are, they are um, the only rattlesnake found here in, in Southern Ontario. 
um, and in all of Ontario, actually, they're actually a pygmy rattlesnake, which means they're really small. Uh, they're only 60 to 75 centimeters, and they're very, very docile and shy. Often, if you're going to come upon one, they'll just stay still, stay alert, and let you know that they're there by shaking their, their rattle or their tail. Um, and the way to identify massasagas is that they have a saddlebag shaped blotch along the dorsal portion of their body. Um, so that's kind of like a figure eight just filled in. And their pupils are actually vertical, which you can't really see from this photo. They also have heat sensing pits that are between their eyes and their nose. And that's what they use to um, detect endothermic prey. Um, so warm blooded animals is old terms would use. And so that kind of just looks like a thermal image camera to them. Um, but obviously we don't know everything about that. We're constantly learning more about these uh, fascinating creatures. And one thing that's really interesting is actually that massasagas are genetically distinct on this island. Um, Stephen Lauhe, who's a professor at Queen's University, ran a study and found that they were genetically distinct and we're hoping to do more research on this population because that's really fascinating. Um, you can also find Hell's Thistle on this property. It's a threatened species um, and you can identify them by this basal rosette of leaves. Um, Black-backed gulls have also been found uh, adjacent to the property. Um, so it's great black back gull uh, found adjacent to the property on neighboring islands nesting, but they've also been seen anecdotally on the property as well. Um, there's Great Lake Sand Cherry, which is only restricted to Great Lake shorelines. And then we also have Tuber's Plantain as well. Um, there's many other species found here, including Dwarf Lake Iris, um, Round Leaf Groundsel, and Lake Huron Spike Sedge. And Snapping Turtles, we found a few of those as well. So that's it for the virtual tour. I hope you all enjoyed it and I hope it's gonna inspire some of you to get out and visit some of these properties when it's safe to do so. Um, and so I thought we'd kind of wrap things up by doing a quick quiz to see if you um, know some of the flora and fauna found on the peninsula. So um, the way that this is gonna work is I'm gonna pull up a slide which is gonna show um, a few of the different species, pictures of them, and then you're just going to have to keep in mind which one you think is the correct answer. And then after that, I'm going to pull up the poll, and then you'll be able to select what you think is the correct, correct answer, and then I'll go through and kind of I'll walk through what the right answer was. So the first question is, which of these images is a Massasauga rattlesnake? So I'll give you about maybe 10 seconds to take a look at these images and figure out which one you think it is. So notice that they're labeled A, B, and C. And on the poll, you'll have the option of selecting A, B, or C as well. So I'll just give you a few minutes to study these images. All right, so I hope that was enough time. And I'm gonna launch the poll now so you won't be able to see these images once I launch the poll. So just keep that letter in mind. All right, so I'm launching the poll and then I'll give you a couple of seconds, maybe 10, 15 seconds to put in your answer. All right, looks like you guys were fast at voting. <laughs> so I will close the poll and it, now I'm gonna share the poll results. I think if I share them, then you can't see the screen. So I'm just gonna hide the poll results shortly after. Um, so it looks like 72% of you were right, selecting A, 14% um, selected B and 13% selected C. So now that I hide the poll, I hope you'll be able to actually see the screen again. Um, so a lot of you were correct. Um, I hid the rattle just because I didn't want to give you, make it too easy. Um, I know we have a lot of experienced naturalists and experts in, in, in the audience today. 
Um, so you can tell that this is a Massasauga by, they have three lateral stripes on the side of their face. Again, the vertical pupil that you can't really see well here. They also have a triangular shaped head. Um, and actually, if I'm gonna go back, I can show you, I don't know if I can, oh yeah. Um, I think this picture shows it better. You can see the keels on each of the scales, which gives it a rough texture if you were to touch it. Not that you should ever be handling uh, any snake or especially on a Massasauga unless you have training. Um, but yeah, so the keel or the ridge along each scale here makes makes it have a rough appearance and also a rough texture if you were to touch it. Um, so that's a, a really good way to ID them as well. Um, this is actually a milk snake. Um, they kind of have a more vibrant coloration when they're young. They, their patches, blotches look almost reddish and they have a really dark outline as well. Um, these can grow to be much longer, about a meter, but a lot of them are often much smaller. They also have a Y or V shape on the top of their head, which you can't really see in this image. Um, and then here we have a juvenile fox snake. So these are actually really commonly mistaken for juvenile milk snakes. Um, you can see that there's no Y patterning here. Um, and as an adult, they'd have more copper head uh, as well. So this is the next question. So uh, the question is, which of these images on the screen is a lakeside daisy? So I think this one should be easy. I described it in great detail for you. <laughs> um, and so just keep in mind which one you think is the right answer. And then I am going to pull up the poll. All right, so I hope that's enough time. I'm gonna pull up the poll now. Just keep in mind which letter you think it is. Okay, it looks like most of you have voted. So I'm gonna close the poll and then I'm gonna share the results. So hopefully you can see the results again. Everyone, well, most people, sorry, not everyone. 74% of you were right, um, it is the Im image A. Um, and then 21% selected B and then 4% selected C. So now I'm gonna bring you back to the slide. Um, and yes, the reason that this is the lakeside daisy is because of those kind of uh, shallow lobes on each of the petals versus on the landscape coreopsis here, we have more of a toothed edge. As I mentioned, the flower head on the landscape coreopsis is a little bit bigger than the lakeside daisy, and it does flower a little bit earlier as well, but there can be overlap. Um, and then down here, we actually have shrubby sink foil. Um, this is more of a shrubby plant found on wetlands and shorelines um, and also found on Bruce Alvar Nature Reserve. Um, and you can actually see the shrubby sink foil leaves over here um, rather than better down here. Um, another thing is that Lakeside Daisy actually has a really short blooming period, usually about one week. It can extend a little bit longer. Um, so if you want to get out and see them, you got to get the right timing, as is the case with a lot of the orchid species that we talked about today as well. So the next question is, which of these images is the purple stemmed cliff break? Um, so you can take a look at these images. A is this one, B is this one, and C is this one. And then I'm going to pull up the poll shortly and then you can select which one you think is the right answer again i think this will be another easier one we'll see all right so i'm going to launch the poll All right, and I'm just gonna give you a couple more seconds and then I'm gonna close it. 
All right, so I'm gonna close the poll. And then now I'm gonna share the results. And again, we've got a really smart audience in the crowd today. Um, so yes, it is C, this is purple stemmed cliff break. Um, B is common or rock polypody and A is oak fern. So I'm gonna hide the poll results and hopefully now you can see the screen again. Um, so yeah, this one's oak fern, this one's common or rock polypody or sometimes just called polypody. And then we have purple stemmed cliff break here. There's also a smooth stem cliff break, but I wouldn't be that difficult because it's really hard to see those um, tiny features through the screen. Um, so oak fern looks quite different. It looks more like a typical fern than I would, than purple stem cliff break, for example. It has a compound leaflet, um, and uh, they're actually they look like three separate leaflets, but it's actually one compound one. And the basal pinna are nearly equal to the entire length of the pinna. Um, and here we have common or rock polypody. Um, they're really distinctive, uh, have smooth margins and a really wide section um, of each pinna is actually attached to the rachis. It's a green stem versus here, you can see a purple or, or darker stem here or rachis um, for these two species. Um, and then uh, they're, they're found mostly on rocky habitats, hence the name rock polypody. It's nice when the name aligns with the habitat. Um, and they're found in shady places uh, and they're about four to five to six inches long and about 1.5 inches across. And then here we have purple stem cliff break. Um, and it has, like I said, dark hairy stems, um, sparse leaflets and uh, just a single leaf coming off at a time or single pinna coming off at a time. And sometimes they're lobed closer to the bottom. And they also have short stalks at the bottom versus stalkless at the top. Um, all of these species uh, reproduce uh, via spores on the back of their, their leaflets or pinna. So I think this is the last question. No, there's two more, sorry. This is the second last question. <laughs> I hope you're enjoying this little quiz. Um, so yeah, keep in mind which one, oh, sorry, the question. Uh, which of these images on screen is a showy lady slipper? So keep in mind which one you think is a showy lady slipper, and then I'm going to pull up the poll. All right, I'm gonna launch the poll now. So keep in mind which letter you think it is. Wow, I made these questions way too easy. <laughs> Note for next time. <laughs> All right, so it looks like most of you voted. I'm gonna close the poll and share it. And yeah, you guys are on it. So C is showy lady slipper. Um, I'm gonna hide the poll and then go to describe each of the species found here. So here we've got pink lady slipper. It looks quite different um, just because of the shape and the, the ridge down the middle of the slipper. Um, it's more pinkish versus the showy lady slipper is actually white with pink or reddish hues on it. Um, it's also a bit more wrinkly. I would just describe it anecdotally as that. Um, and then the showy lady slipper is a bit more full. Um, and then the ram's head lady slipper just has a really distinctive shape um, that you really don't see in other, other um, lady slipper species. Uh, and it's kind of a, a white color, but all, the, all these dark red veins make it look like it's mostly red. Um, yeah. Okay, so this is our last question. Hope you guys ace it. So I'm asking you which of the images on screen is a hill's thistle. So note that I've included close-ups of the flowers and leaves where necessary as well. And they have the corresponding letters on them. 
So keep in mind which one you think is a Hills Thistle. And now I'm going to launch the poll. Alrighty. Looks like most of you have voted. I'm gonna close the poll and then share the results. You guys aced this quiz. Um, yeah, so C is the hill thistle. So now I'm gonna hide the poll and go through a couple of these species. Um, so the thing that's a dead giveaway is the basal rosette or the hill thistle really. Uh, as I mentioned, it is a species at risk. It's threatened. It's found mostly on alvar habitats, but also can be found in other open areas as well. And it's really distinguished from other um, thistles by its shallow lobed and wavy margins. And they have fewer, thinner, and sparser spines than other thistles as well. Um, and the stem usually goes up to about 60 centimeters. So here we have Canada thistle, which looks slightly similar with the purple flower, but this one can grow a lot taller. It can grow up to two meters, and it's actually an invasive species. Uh, and as the name suggests, you'd think it's a Canadian thistle, but it's actually brought over from somewhere in Europe. Some people postulate somewhere from the Mediterranean, but we're not really sure. Um, brought over by some of the earliest settlers here. And um, it is highly invasive, prefers open areas and roadsides. And uh, the way you can tell this species is that um, the, the leaf shape is, is quite distinct here. Deeply lobed, it's stalkless, it's glabrous and glossy. Sorry, glossy, not glabrous. Um, and and uh, yeah, it's a stalkless uh, uh, leaf as well. And then here we have pitcher's thistle. This is another threatened thistle here in Ontario. And it's mostly found along shorelines and sandy habitats. Um, the leaves are really, really distinctive on this one. I couldn't find a good image online of them, um, but they kind of have a whitish, greenish fuzz on top and they're really thin and narrow. And that's a really great way to tell. Um, these flowers are usually white um, versus Canada thistle can be white or purple. So I hope you all enjoyed this presentation. Um, thank you so much for participating and, and enamoring me with, <laughs> with my polls. Um, and if you have any questions after this, I know I ran a little bit late, sorry about that. Um, you can feel free to email me with any questions, whether it's about a particular nature reserve or, um, anything that I talked about today. I also really wanted to thank Quest Nature Tours for having us and, and hosting us for this series. We're so excited to be partnered with you and, and thanks for giving us your platform. And we also want to specifically thank you for contributing towards our nature reserves program and the Gananoque Lake Nature Reserve Acquisition, which is uh, the last webinar in this series. James Camster, one of our board members, actually presented on. Um, and we'd also like to thank Bruce Power for funding a lot of our stewardship work on the peninsula this year. Uh, we really appreciate their support. Um, yeah, thank you so much. Excellent, Samara. Thank you so much. And uh, in fact, we have uh, a number of questions here. So if you, I hope you have a couple of minutes here to, to uh, assist with some of these questions. Um, well, actually, one of them here is a comment. Uh, from Emily. Emily's mentioning that uh, they were up at Petrol in September, Petrol Point, and noticed that people have been going off trail to take photos of orchids. It was really sad to see. And uh, she's wondering if uh, what sort of effort you're going to make moving forward to promote responsible enjoyment at the site. Is that something you've looked at or, or have noted? Yeah, so actually we have a pretty good like system of people, you know, respecting our, our trails, especially on that property, especially because it's so popular and there's a lot of people that kind of keep each other in check in a way. Um, it is definitely a challenge for us. We're not on the reserves every day. Uh, we often visit our properties a couple of times a year at max. So um, thank you so much for bringing it up. And it is something that um, our local stewards help us with as well. So Justin briefly mentioned that we have local stewards on the ground who and in the case of Petrol Point, are our neighbors, um, and they keep an eye on the property. So I can definitely follow up with them and uh, see if they have any suggestions. The thing is that we 
don't really want to put up like railings or anything like that along the boardwalk to prevent people from leaving just because it obstructs the view and especially for the accessibility standpoint railings at a certain height for someone that's standing would obstruct their view um so there is that challenge as well um but thank you so much for bringing that up and i'll definitely follow up to see if we have any ideas of how to how to deal with that and it is very damaging to these sensitive habitats there's actually an area on on petrol point where there's an atv rut um from a long time ago and it looked recent um and then we went back in our files and found it was over 20 years ago recorded in the exact same spot so it is really important um, that people do stay on the boardwalks i have one question here are there map boards at the entrance to the access point sorry can you repeat that are there are there, are there map boards like a like a plaque with a map when you go to each of the reserves yeah so um the ones that I talked about today, yes. Um, some of our other properties, there aren't, and we're working on updating a lot of our trail maps for our properties. Um, some of them, like most, I'd say most of them have them. There's just a couple where we're missing them still, but most of them do, and most of them say like how easy the trail is, what surface it is, like whether it's dirt or gravel, um, whether it's successful or not. And, and that sort of thing and what habitats they go through. Um, but yes, definitely the three that were open to visitors that we talked about today have actually the maps that I showed in, in the PowerPoint. Great. Uh, another question here uh, from Claire was, is there a charge? I think I know the answer, but it's, is there a charge for entering the reserves? It's a good question. No, no, there's no, this is all free of charge. We really want people to get out and experience nature and um, we want we want this to be accessible to everyone. So there's, there's no charge for accessing these properties. Great, another question here, which you may have touched on when you talked about the Alvar, but what is the definition of an Alvar exactly? Yeah, so it's an open dollar stone pavement and dollar stone is a type of limestone just with a different calcium carbonate um, composition. And uh, what's really characteristic is that it's either, and there's a lot of different types of Alvar. So I just touched on a couple today that we have on the peninsula, on the Saugeen Bruce Peninsula. And so um, another main characteristic is the depth of the soil. It won't be more than 15 centimeters. So think about some of those big cedar trees that I showed you, and they're growing on a depth of maximum depth of 15 centimeters of soil. Um, and so there's different types of Alvar habitats. There's savanna. Um, which you'll find actually on our Pelee Islands or Northern Alvar Nature Reserve. Um, there's treed Alvar, there's open Alvar, there's shrubby Alvar, um, and a few more that I'm, I'm not mentioning. But um, basically, the, the basic thing is that it's uh, a dollar stone pavement with a very thin soil layer. Uh, question here What was the name of the thistle egg? The thistles, you had, th you had three yeah, thistles and an egg. What was egg? Yeah, so it was pitcher's thistle. Pitcher's thistle, okay. Yeah, yeah. Pitcher's so it's thistle. also a threatened species in Ontario, um, along with the hills thistle, which is also threatened. Right. And uh, one question here, which you touched on, is when do the lady slippers bloom in the spring? I mean, you talk generally about orchids, but when are the lady slippers blooming? I think that's in late May, early June. Is that or? sort of in June, right? Because you have the different ones. Yeah, so they do vary in timing. Um, it's not, uh, you know, prescriptive. Everything blooms at the same time. It would be kind of cool if it did. Um, but yeah, around mid-May to, to late June. Some some orchids, like, I mean, not the lady slippers, but you have sporanthes, which are um, like the white bog orchid. For, not sorry, white bog like the lady tresses, sorry, the Sparanthi species um, flower later in August, September. Um, but yeah, the lady slippers are mid, mid May until probably like the end of, mid to end of June. The, the height is really the first couple of weeks of June, usually. Yeah. Um, obviously with fluctuating temperatures these days, um, it's a little bit not as predictable as it used to be. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I think my experience there at uh, 
on the peninsula is sort of early June is the ram's head, kind of early June, mid June is the yellow lady slipper. And then the showy tends to be a little bit later, like till the end of June. So yeah, this kind of a, a variation there. Um, another question here, is the Malcolm Kirk reserve accessible? No, it's it's a slog. I've gone there a couple of times um, and you have to go through about knee to waist deep swamp for a couple of hours um, before you even get to the edge of the property and then it's all swamp as well um, and wetland habitat. It's beautiful, um, but definitely not easily accessible. Uh, and that's why I didn't really highlight it today. Excellent. So I think that's all for the um, all the questions that I can make out here. Uh, I just do, I do want to uh, add uh, there was one question: Will the recording to this webinar be made available? I'm very happy to say that we are we are actually recording this, and we will be sending a link to the recording of this presentation to all of the attendees. So even if you couldn't attend or you attended part of this, you will get this, and uh, you can look for that today. And you can feel free to share the recording with anyone who wasn't even registered for this. So let's get out the word about um, these reserves on the Soggy and Bruce Peninsula. And while I have you, so just a quick reminder, uh, we do have the third in our series of Ontario Nature, um, Nature Reserves webinars, which is coming up on November 18th, and that's the Stone Road Alvar uh, Nature Reserve on Keeley Island. And I think, Samara, you briefly mention that because we were talking about Alvars. I think that was the context. So uh, if you haven't signed up for that, uh, watch for that. In fact, I think you can link to that, to, to the registration page for that webinar on the Ontario Nature website. If you go to the Ontario Nature page and just scroll down a little bit, you'll see the registration um, link there. So, so thank you all of you for attending and um, thank you very much uh, Samara for sharing your insights and background here on the uh, on those four nature reserves on the Soggy Bruce Peninsula. It makes me want to get up back up to the uh, peninsula myself. And uh, to everyone, uh, thank you very much for attending and hope you have a chance to enjoy the beautiful weather outside today. And let's be in touch. Bye-bye, everyone.